Good afternoon. Uh, my name, uh, for those of you who do not know, is Martin Sanchez Jankowski, and I'm the chair for the Center for Ethnographic Research. And I want to welcome you to our first fall event uh, for the year 2020. Uh, before we get started with the formal uh, presentation today, um, I, I would like to briefly discuss the uh, future of the Center for Ethnographic Research. As many of you know, the Center for Ethnographic Research is part of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues. And it has been determined by the uh, uh, executive uh, vice chair, no, the vice chancellor for research at UC Berkeley that the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues should be closed as of June 30th of 2021, nine more months. The center is part of the Institute and uh, we're not sure what the future of the center will be after the Institute closes. I think it's a really mistake on the part of the administration to close the Institute as the center has had a wonderful home here and an important home here and one that has actually been uh, very important for it producing the research that it has done. Um, I'm not sure about the final, final decision. And so I am encouraging you to join me in protesting the decision by the Vice Chancellor for Research. And if you are interested in what the future will bring and also interested in putting forth your name and some level of protest to this decision, uh, you can contact the a website that we have constructed called socialjusticefutures.org. Um, and the link to that uh, is in the chat uh, area of the, uh, as well. Now, I want to turn to our formal event uh, today. Um, and uh, I want to say that our speaker will speak to us for about 30 minutes. Uh, then there will, this will be followed by a discussion. Um, and uh, if you have questions, please use the Q&A uh, feature on your, uh, on your screen. Um, the Center for Ethnographic Re Research's academic coordinator, Deborah Lustig, will, uh, will ask these questions on your behalf. Now, uh, it is a extreme pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker who was really uh, a part of our center for many, many years. Um, she is an assistant professor at sociology at the University of Toronto. Her name is Emine Fidan uh, El Chiolo. Um, and she is going to share with us uh, her current research, but I do want to say that she has published uh, quite a bit in leading journals, social problems, ethnography, qualitative uh, sociology. But today she's going to provide us with comments uh, about her new book um, that has just come out. Uh, and it's the title really of our talk today. Um, and that is Divided by the Wall, Progressive and Conservative Immigration Politics at the U.S.-Mexican Border. Please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor uh, Echelou. Thank you uh, for that kind introduction. Let me just uh, set up my screen here. All right. Okay, um, so thank you again. Uh, thank you for the invitation from the Center for Ethnographic Research at the ISSI and um, the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Disciplinary Migration Institute uh, as well for inviting me. And thank you to the audience for making the time to come see me. Um, and uh, and I'm I'm grateful uh, to have this opportunity to um, to talk to California about my research uh, today. Um, so I actually wanted to start with a message that my daughter wanted to relay to you, um, which is that uh, 
the ISSI uh, was a very important part of my um, of my academic growth and academic journey. And the book that I'm going to be talking to you about today would not have been possible without um, uh, my uh, affiliation with the ISSI. Um, I, I was a graduate fellow at the ISSI. Um, I had an office in the ISSI building. I attended many talks, met many faculty and students. Um, and so I, I feel like uh, besides um, Barrows Hall, which is where the sociology department um, is, the ISSI really was where I um, learn to um, become a, a sociologist and academic a researcher. So I want to echo Martine's um, call for you to consider um, uh, signing the petition to save the ISSI. Okay, so I am now going to turn to my formal talk. Um, I actually want to um, begin with a vignette. Uh, about a 28 year old white woman who I refer to as Gail and who I met during ethnographic field work in uh, Arizona. Gail is a member of a pro immigrant organization that I refer to as the humanitarians. Um, as a member of the humanitarians, she and her fellow volunteers hiked deep into Arizona's Sonoran Desert where migrants crossed. And, um, and they would leave out water. And Gail recalled one of the first times she was in the desert. She and a fellow humanitarian encountered three migrants, two young men and a woman. They were um, siblings from Guatemala and the group was too tired to go on. Their feet were covered in blisters and they were severely dehydrated. While the humanitarians attended to their injuries, gave them food and water, um, the woman uh, in the group asked the American volunteers to call US Border Patrol. The siblings wanted to turn themselves in. Gail's colleague uh, uh, cautioned the migrant group uh, gently. They, they said migrants were um, abused in Border Patrol custody, even short-term custody. Were they sure they wanted to turn themselves in? Yes, said the woman firmly. Please call Border Patrol. Reluctantly, the humanitarians called a federal agency, and within a few hours, Border Patrol agents packed the family into their van and drove away. Now, in the very same regions that Americans like Gail distributed water, other Americans assembled to do armed patrols in the desert, find migrants, and turn them over to Border Patrol. One such group is an anti-immigrant um, grassroots organization that I call the Soldiers. Rick, a 57-year-old white man, was their leader. One winter morning, I am with the Soldiers on one of their so-called operations um, in the desert, and two migrants, teenage boys, emerge from a dry river bed. The Soldiers' main Spanish speaker, Tommy, walks over, barking to see the contents of their bags. Um, he finds the boy's IDs. He turns to Rick and says, hey boss, these are minors. Rick rumbles sarcastically. Oh yay, they get to stay. He rolls his eyes. We learn that the younger boy is Guatemalan and his companion is Honduran. Rick tells him to sit by the campfire to stay warm, then walks away to call border patrol. Another soldier offers the boys uh, food and water. We learned that the boys got separated from the group that they were traveling with and got lost. Wanting to turn themselves in, they had come over to the soldiers' campsite. Eventually, two Border Patrol agents arrive and they take the boys away. So, in putting these two vignettes side by side, I want to draw your attention to a few things. First, in both cases, the actions I describe are essentially identical. A group of American civilians encounter a group of Central American migrants in Arizona's Sonoran Desert, give them food and water, and call Border Patrol. Also in both cases, the activists do not have a direct connection with the issue around which they mobilize. Despite their different worldviews, Gail, Rick, and the other activists I spoke to were not personally impacted by U.S. immigration policies. Despite wanting to defend immigrants, Gail herself was not an immigrant, nor did she have any kin who were. 
And although he dedicated his desert operations to Americans who had died because of injuries allegedly inflicted by undocumented immigrants, Rick himself did not personally know anyone who was killed in this way. Activists like Gail and Rick share another characteristic. In both cases, activists knew that their efforts were not going to bring about the long-term change that they wanted. Gail knew that no matter how much water the humanitarians um, put out in the desert, migrants would continue to die from dehydration and exposure to the elements. Rick knew that no matter how often he and his comrades patrolled the desert, uh, he could never deter cross-border traffic of people and contraband. So despite the futility of uh, their actions, Gail and Rick saw their mobilization as very meaningful. My goal was to explore those meanings. Specifically, my research was animated by two puzzling observations. First, why are citizens who are predominantly white Americans staking a claim in the Im immigration struggle in this way? And second, why are they mobilizing when they don't believe that their actions will make a difference? And what I'm gonna argue is that immigration politics is not just about immigration. Immigration politics has become a go-to language for citizens to express their unease with inequality. Uh, there's obviously a lot of um, literature, a lot of scholarship on American immigration politics, a lot of which has focused on left-wing pro-immigrant mobilization. And these studies about leftist immigration activism tend to examine the factors that facilitate collective mobilization. So although it is empirically detailed, this scholarship often avoids a critical discussion of movements, ideologies, aims, and motivations. Studies about anti-immigrant activists are fewer in number and less empirical, um, and anti-immigrant activist ideas are often understudied. And additionally, research about both sides um, under examines the class, race, gender, and motivations of those who mobilize. So a way to kind of sum this uh, critique up is that there is this tendency to ignore uh, social movements, um, political ends, and really uh, hyper-focus on their means. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there's a sort of systematic uh, ig ignoring or avoidance of questions about why people mobilize and who participants are in relation to social structures. And this tendency to ignore political ends is not unique to migration scholarship. Um, in fact, it's part of a paradigm shift in sociology. In a review he wrote, um, uh, sociologist Andrew Walder highlighted this shift. Uh, he argued that political sociology used to examine why participants adopted certain goals, uh, certain political goals, and what the relationship was between uh, groups' political orientations and uh, social structures. But in recent decades, uh, a new paradigm has emerged in political sociology. Now, the dominant approach um, is to examine the mobilization strategies rather than the political character of a struggle. And this paradigm persists today. It affects how sociologists analyze, uh, analyze contentious politics, including the struggle around immigration. But what, what I realized is that I couldn't ignore people's ideas or their ideologies nor, or their political orientation. And I also couldn't ignore activist positionalities. So in my research, um, political orientation was important for two reasons. First, I realized that um, ideas, ideology, and, and specifically ideas about state power uh, were really important um, in terms of shaping the strategies that organizations favored. And second, these ideas about the state were important also because they were profoundly meaningful at a personal level. This is because these state-directed ideas and practices gave activists the tools to manage their own complex intersectional identities. I also noticed that the two sides were not only distinct political groups, but they were also distinct social groups. Um, so 
specifically, there was a clear class difference between pro-immigrant activists and anti-immigrant activists. Compared to their pro-immigrant opponents, anti-immigrant activists had less formal education, <clears throat> they had experienced downward social mobility in their lifetimes, and they did not have a lot of choice in whether and how they were employed. Um, there's also a very important gender disparity across the two sides. Pro-immigrant activists tended to be women and anti-immigrant activists tended to be men. So, but despite these differences, um, members of both sides grappled with a tension in their identity. And I detected two kinds of tensions. Um, the main preoccupation among pro-immigrant activists was this tension between their progressive worldview and their privileged backgrounds. A progressive but privileged uh, subjectivity was plagued by the sense that that privilege came with a moral obligation to help less fortunate others. Meanwhile, um, the right wing um, counterparts struggled with being white but working class or the disparity between their in-group status as white men and the diminishing sense of control that accompanied downward um, mobility. So what made white but working class a troubled identity was the idea that in order to be a good or competent white man, one could not be or feel precarious. And I should mention that hints of both of these tense identities can be found across studies of whiteness. For instance, um, Justin Guest and uh, Jennifer Carlson both discuss how a sense of white entitlement paired with experience of downward social mobility, particularly among wor working class people and lower middle class people, can engender confusion, anxiety, and racial resentment. Similarly, Ruth Frankenberg and Barbara Heron have shown how fraught identities can drive political action among white middle class women. And both have discussed how improving the circumstances of the racialized other um, has been an important way for white middle class women to feel counted in society. So I lean fairly heavily on this literature um, in my intervention. Um, now, I also realized that uh, pro-immigrant and anti-immigrant activists talked about state power very differently. So pro-immigrant activists saw the state as extremely powerful and dangerously competent. The, their opponents, meanwhile, saw the state as emasculated and dangerously incompetent. And in this image, what I'm trying to get at is actually there, there's a part of the fence at the Arizona Sonora border um, uh, that this image is based off of. And um, it's where the tall fence posts end and the vehicle barriers start. And, um, and although a vehicle couldn't necessarily couldn't would have trouble getting across from one side to the other you could imagine a person being able to cross uh, that border fairly easily and um, a lot of my anti-immigrant activist interlocutors uh, would make a pilgrimage to this part of the border and take pictures of themselves um, because this was very sort of indicative of how they understood um, the border as being a sort of a weak line of defense. So empowering an emasculated state bolstered anti-immigrant activist claims to white masculinity while weakening the state offered pro-immigrant activists an opportunity to do or perform white middle-class femininity. Um, and I'm going to explain this more in a bit. Um, so I find that immigration politics has become sort of an arena in which white people can carry out projects of self-affirmation as they cope with the effects of inequality. And although activists wanted to see a change in the world, um, what sustained their mobilization was the fact that their participation allowed them to experience a change in themselves. So, um, my study uh, is very ethnographic. Um, it draws heavily on um, 20 months of participant observation, some of which happened between 2011 and 2012. And I did a field revisit um, shortly after the Trump administration came to power. Um, and I also supplemented this, uh, this participant observation with uh, formal semi-structured 
um, interviews, uh, although I had tons of conversations in the field as well, um, but I don't count those as formal interviews. Um, and then I also did a lot of content analysis of um, of material, whether it's media or, or text or uh, whatever um, that the organizations that I studied produced. And in total, I studied five grassroots organizations, although in this um, in this talk, I'm only going to talk about two of them, um, the humanitarians and the soldiers. And I'm happy to talk about the other three in the Q&A if there's any interest. Um, and specifically, in it, I'm going to focus on um, Gail and Rick, who I introduced in the beginning of the talk, because they these two um, uh, respondents really exemplify the characteristics of their peers. So um, let's start with Gail. Oh, before I get into um, Gail's story, I want to say one other thing about the sort of historical um, and political context of this fieldwork. Um, so in the early 1990s, um, the federal government adopted a border enforcement scheme called Prevention Through Deterrence. Many of you might be familiar with this. Um, and uh, what this scheme did, ended up doing is that it funneled migrants um, from sort of ur urban, safer crossing points to Arizona. Um, and uh, and it caused, and because of this funneling effect, because people were uh, forced to cross through the Sonoran Desert, um, uh, it, a lot of people perished on their journey north. Um, and so migrants uh, uh, would pay very steep fees to professional smugglers um, in order to navigate that rough terrain. Um, and as a result of, of that new market, um, uh, 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 drug cartels or drug trafficking organizations work their way into this market. Um, so Southern Arizona and specifically the places where Gail and Rick are, um, became really important points of entry, uh, un unauthorized entry into the United States. Okay, so um, I want to start with Gail. Uh, as I mentioned, she's a 28-year-old white woman uh, who I met in Arizona. Um, I learned that Gail grew up in an all-white suburb of Ohio and both of her parents were university educated professionals. Gail herself also attended a university where she studied political science. And later she traveled extensively through um, South America and Europe. But more than any of these um, experiences, she told me that it was a friendship with a coworker um, that was really instrumental in shaping her political consciousness. Uh, this coworker, um, uh, was originally from Honduras, and as far as Gail was concerned, the two young women were equals. Um, they were just these two friends who were working together at a at a bakery. That illusion of uh, equality vanished one day when Immigration and Customs Enforcement raided the bakery where the two young women worked and took away Gail's friend. Um, in an instance, Gail realized the vastly different life opportunities she and her friend had. So Gail lost touch um, with her friend, but the experience of agents taking that friend away stuck with her. After graduating, Gail moved to um, Washington DC where she began to work at a um, uh, well-known nonprofit organization that advocated for immigrant rights. Um, soon, however, she began grappling with her privilege again. Uh, her position of power became visible to Gail when her um, organization started working on a class action lawsuit on behalf of asylum seekers. So the lawsuit was aimed to make asylum seekers eligible for work visas um, while they waited for a final decision on their asylum cases. Um, this way, asylum seekers who were trying to make ends meet would not risk their whole as as asylum case if they got caught working illegally. And Gail was tasked with finding the plaintiffs 
for this lawsuit, um, and specifically plaintiffs who would make the lawsuit compelling in a court of law. And so here's how she talked about that process. So I'm this middle class white person. I know how the courts are going to view the most or least vulnerable people. We want this Nigerian woman who's protecting her daughter from female genital mutilation, but the Honduran dude is escaping violence. Nah, he's fucking gang. I'm this young person making these decisions. It's a game and we won. That affects a lot of people. But I realized that I don't feel good in this position anymore. Um, the DC organization does incredible work, but it just made me realize that I didn't want to work on things in this broad based way. So as soon as the case was over, Gail quit her job. And in fact, um, she left DC and she moved to Arizona and became a full time unpaid uh, volunteer with the humanitarians. I asked Gail how Arizona was different from Washington DC and this is what she said. Being out here in the desert, there's that direct human thing. If we change this one policy that will affect all these people and I value that and that's really important, but having an actual human in front of you and being like, what do we need to do to get you where you need to go? That's meaningful. So, Gail um, assigned more meaning to the singular act of giving water to a migrant in the desert than to a large scale effort to improve the lives of 3 million asylum seekers. This is a remarkable rationale. So her activism was driven not by its actual outcomes, but by the pursuit to answer grading questions about morality and positionality. How can I be progressive, but white middle class poised for a life of material comfort? Again and again, I realized that this was a dilemma that framed pro-immigrant activists stories about themselves. So what exactly was it about the border that helped Gail and other pro-immigrant activists cope with this identity? Taking water out into the desert at its most fundamental level allowed Gail to use her privilege to weaken the state. So this is how Gail put it. Every time a person makes it to their destination in the US, in spite of all the state power that is ensuring that they don't make it, that one person making it and anyone helping them along the way, that feels like a privilege to feel useful in some way. The fact that Gail could help someone in spite of all the state power gave her unparalleled satisfaction. This satisfaction stemmed from how Gail and other pro-immigrant activists understood the state. In this worldview, the US state was a powerful anti-hero. Racialized migrants were its helpless victims. Um, and when migrants crossed the border, activists told me they did so involuntarily. So if human agency was conceptualized as a spectrum, migrants were on one end while white middle-class Americans were on the opposite end. So for this group of activists, privilege often felt like an impediment uh, in the pursuit of allyship. But at the border, there was an opportunity to exploit one's privilege in order to weaken the state and help migrants. Instead of being progressive but privileged, um, they could be progressive and privileged. So now I want to move on to Rick who um, we also met earlier. Uh, he's the leader of the soldiers, which is an anti-immigrant organization that I studied. So Rick told me that his interest in immigration politics um, began on a particular day in late 2008, when he realized that his world was falling apart. That day, Rick went to work. His job, he explained, was to build high rises. He had been in the construction business for nearly three decades. I was the guy who the construction company handed the blueprint this thick six months before the building even came out of the ground. My job was to study this thing and ask architects, engineers, and plumbers, why are we doing it this way? So that by the time we were ready to go, we'd be ready to go. I, he added, it was a lot of responsibility and I thrived on it. But on that fateful day in 2008, Rick was laid off. And when he lost his job, Rick was 48 years old. He was a Marine Corps veteran and a college dropout. He did not have a skill set outside of construction. 
Rick said he went from making eighty thousand a year on to, a year to twelve thousand on unemployment. He lost his home. His wife divorced him. He began living out of his car. He started drinking after years of sobriety. His life felt like it was spiraling out of control. In the years that followed, Rick could never get back up on his feet. Um, he began connecting the dots in his head. Maybe he was having such a hard time because there was an endless supply of quote unquote illegal aliens willing to accept low wages. Going to the border was a way for Rick to regain control over his life. He wanted to do rather than to be done to. When I was with Rick on a so-called operation, there were seven people. But just with those seven people, he said, I've closed about five miles of some of the cartel's best smuggling corridors. Gesturing at the mountains behind him, Rick continued, look at this train. It's nothing but mountains. The drug cartel want to be in this mountains train where they can hide, so we force them into the flatter areas where it's easier to be caught by border patrol. Just as with pro-immigrant activism, I realized that the actual impact of their mobilization was highly questionable. After all, the soldiers' efforts may have forced the smugglers to move from mountainous terrain to flatter terrain, but it would be hard to argue that they actually deterred um, anyone from trying to cross the border altogether. I asked Rick, was this a pointless effort? And he responded gruffly, then I guess I'll die here. Everybody makes a choice in life about what, what they do. He added, look, Border Patrol agents will stop in and ask what you got. They love us because we're helping them do their job. I'm more at peace here doing this than I've ever been in my life. So how do we make sense of someone like Rick? Um, well, he had overcome big challenges uh, in his life, unemployment, the loss of a home, divorce, substance addiction, and through it all, he was plagued by a visceral sense of marginalization. Rick was socialized in a country where men like him had material and symbolic advantages over everyone else. The wages of whiteness created a set of expectations about who society should celebrate and reward. But the structural pressure of class made it feel like he was being deprived of his birthright. Rick was devastated, confused. To be white but working class meant feeling like he was owed power, but powerless to do anything about being denied that power. Being on the border helped Rick assume a sense of control. While pro-immigrant respondents saw migrants as victims, restrictionists saw them as um, victimizers, emboldened by a weak line of defense. According to Rick, migration persisted because there was not enough, there weren't enough Border Patrol agents amassed at the US-Mexico boundary. The soldiers' tactics were shaped by this analysis. The group organized round-the-clock stakeouts within a mile of the international boundary. Um, and then share this in, intel with Border Patrol. So this state strengthening activism gave Rick a sense of purpose. It counteracted the deprivation he otherwise felt in his white but working class life. So um, Gail, Rick, and the other activists I studied desperately wanted to change the rules of immigration, um, but immigration policy did not personally impact them and they were uncertain that their collective action would bring about the change that they wanted. So what sustained their, so what sustained their participation in these organizations? And I realized the, the relationship between participants' intersectional identities and the organization's state-directed practices um, held the key to unpacking these puzzles. I realized that the act of mobilizing was saturated with meanings that went beyond changing immigration policy. Immigration politics was a highly symbolic struggle, wherein the integrity of citizen participants' identities were at stake. So yes, people like Gail and Rick wanted to change the distribution of power in society, but their mobilization was also about self-transformation in a context of deepening inequality. So what kept people engaged was the conviction that their state-directed action was also helping them alter the imbalance of power between themselves and the rest of society. 
when my respondents tried to make sense of who belonged, they were simultaneously concerned about how and whether they themselves belonged. In other words, immigration politics is not just a struggle of, over whether to include or exclude the racialized non-citizen other. It is also a struggle to figure out how white citizen selves fit into a stratified society. It's a way to deal with the problem of being American but anxious. As sociologists of migration, we need to be aware of this phenomenon and we need to ask ourselves, what do political struggles about them reveal about us? So what does this all mean? Um, my research suggests that in order to diffuse the contentiousness of immigration policy, we need to think about and address growing social inequality. And this inequality is fostering um, misery anxiety, anomi, and uncertainty across the socioeconomic spectrum, uh, including among those who are ostensibly secure citizen members. So staking a claim in um, immigration politics has become a way to articulate other concerns. Um, and so we need to ask, what are those other concerns? And how is this contention around immigration obscuring other larger social problems that are connected to capitalism, uh, to white supremacy, to imperialism? And we cannot address these problems exclusively by altering immigration policy, and certainly not by relying on the same kinds of narrowly conceived policy changes that have been used in the past. Thank you. I have uh, one question uh, that I'd like to ask, and it has to do with uh, Rick. I mean, you spent a great deal of time about, uh, you know, about the issues having to do with uh, personal identity, et cetera. Um, but I want to look at uh, something that conservatives often say, and I want to know if it has any kind of empirical basis to it, because it could. Um, and I want to know if that's the case in Rick's case. Now, Rick sees himself as somebody who was in the construction industry and is displaced by essentially cheaper workers. And the real question empirically is, did you, in fact, go to where Rick was working? And are, are, the, are most of the people working there uh, Latinos uh, who may or may not be uh, may or may not be legal uh, in the United States because we we do know that Latinos take jobs in the agricultural area that no one else wants. But we also know that Latinos dominate the construction industry as well. Um, and the real question becomes, is Rick really uh, wrong in what he sees as the protection of him and other "Quote unquote whites uh, uh, job job securities." Um, so no, I didn't go to Rick's um, workplace to uh, see what the demographics were in his specific company. Um, but yes, so Arizona is a very um, uh, there's a there's a high concentration of Latinos living in Arizona and um, certainly working in the construction sector. Uh, and in 2008, when the recession hit, um, you know, Arizona was one of the worst hit states in the country and construction specifically was one of the worst uh, hit industries. Um, so he, you know, it was awful luck on uh, for him to be in Arizona working in construction. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, to what extent is there some reality behind his, um, his analysis of what's going on? Um, I mean, I guess you could make that argument, but I think it misses the bigger point, which is that, um, uh, you know, that uh, there's, a, there's a tiered uh, labor market, right? Um, that, uh, that very much benefits capitalists, right? 
um, of, and it's a racially tiered and uh, labor market where, um, you know, you're paying higher wages to certain groups and far, far below um, wages to other groups. And, and off of that, you make a profit. Um, so, uh, you know, attacking your coworker, right, isn't necessarily going to solve the larger structural problem, right? Um, and even at a more sort of, I mean, so Rick could have taken that analysis and said, I'm going to go and picket this employer, or I'm going to go and, I don't know, join a union, or I'm going to go and, um, uh, you know, uh, protest the employers and uh, report the employer to ICE. He didn't do any of these things. He instead decided that the way to kind of regain control um, was going to the border. So there isn't this very, it, it isn't a, a one-to-one -one kind of um, correspondence between his sort of analysis of what's going on, right? And then what he does. And that's part of why I'm saying that these are folks who are mobilizing are not directly themselves impacted by immigration policy. I mean, certainly, right, where we can say our entire economy relies on immigration and therefore in some way we're all indirectly benefiting from it or we're, you know, we're complicit in it somehow, certainly. But here what I'm talking about is just these very direct personal effects that are not there. Um, and so uh, that that was sort of my, my argument. I, I don't know if that completely answers your question. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, really whether this social basis of these movements yeah. is essentially just a personal issue having to do with personality and a particular forms of personality or whether they're really based on some kind of sense of not even whiteness, but, uh, but an idea of losing, you know, one's form of, of, of income, basically. That yeah. was the base. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think. I mean, there's definitely, you know, there's a there's a class component that's very important, but it's very intimately, um, you know, the the people who are participating in this kind of politics are generally white working class men. So we have to sort of, you know, it's it's that 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 whiteness is a really fundamental aspect of of. Um, their analysis and and the, this question about personality I think is important as well. Um, I actually did a talk last week and some and the discussant said, you know, your analysis is this sort of socio psychoanalytic analysis, and I think there's some truth to that um, because obviously I'm talking to people on their own by themselves and they're giving me the the you know very unique details of their own lives. Um, but then when I, you know, when I put all those, um, all those facts together, there were certain patterns that I saw, right? So like I said, even though I'm presenting Rick on his own, he really exemplifies that whole um, story of, of, you know, falling, <laughs> um, you know, and, and uh, marginalization and, um, you know, that whole sense of, of just, um, being entitled to things and then not being given those things, that's a really um, central part of a lot of the life stories that I heard um, from, the, from my anti-immigrant respondents. I'd like to um, follow up on that last point you just made, but first I just want to say it's just a pleasure to have you with us and to um, have read your book and see how your work has evolved over the over the years since you were a student when it was already so rich and exciting and I think one of the things that I was really impressed by at that time and that's still unusual is that you did do ethnographic research with these two sides um, and in what you just said you talked mostly about them as individuals and also in your talk today you chose to focus on two individuals and of, of course I know that there's a lot more than that in the book um, but I wanted to, to ask you to talk a little bit about um, what you learned from your participant observation in these groups and you know how the group dynamics played a role um, as well and then I have a 
a, a, a second question, which is about your own, how especially the um, anti-immigration activists perceived you because, you know, based on your phenotype, you could be Latina and your name suggests that you're not from the US. And so I remember you talking a little bit about that before and just uh, like, like to hear more about that as well. Thanks. Uh, yes, um, great questions. Um, so uh, in terms of the group dynamics, I think this is really important, right, um, in terms of political socialization. So I think what I saw was, um, you know, the personal life stories kind of pull these people into this collective action. But then as they mobilize, right, that worldview becomes more rigid, it becomes more cohesive because they're constantly talking to each other, right? So they might come into this, right, um, with this feeling of, I need to do something with my life where I feel like I'm in control. Um, hey, look, there are a bunch of veterans who are also in this organization. They all seem like me. Um, you know, uh, they have guns, I have guns, um, you know, there's this like feeling of camaraderie um, or this desire for camaraderie. And in this, the, the desire for camaraderie is actually very, um, very key to white working class identity in the United States. In the absence of unions, in the absence of other sorts, sorts of mutual aid societies and, and all of those sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, um, sort of organizational civil society life that used to exist uh, once upon a time and are not really available anymore, um, this becomes one of those, um, it, it becomes a very sort of enticing um, kind of um, activity, right? And then they join and then um, there's, you know, there's obviously some political sympathy towards what the group is doing, but that's when they start to sort of really, um, you know, their political ideas about immigration really harden and, and, um, and, and become more, more detailed, maybe even more sophisticated um, was is through these group dynamics. So the group dynamics are absolutely key because um, you know, that's where friendships form and then that's where the political sort of uh, socialization really happens. Um, and then in terms of your second question around, you know, how do anti, how was I able to do field work with, um, uh, you know, uh, a group that is um, very hostile towards um, people of color. Um, and I should add, uh, who are predominantly um, men, right? And so me walking in there as a woman, that's also, that also poses some challenges. Um, so I will say that when I started this field work, I thought that it would be really, really hard and in fact, impossible. And that with the left, it would be really, really easy. Um, and, uh, but what I realized once I was in the field that um, it was actually harder to gain access to the left in some ways um, as a researcher uh, versus with the right where um, there was a sense of like, you are so different than us that we're uh, like intrigued by you, right? Whereas with the left, it was sort of like, you're kind of like us, but you're a what? A researcher? <laughs> um, so what exactly is your political, you know, worldview, you know? So there was a little bit more sort of suspicion in some way. Now on the right, certainly um, a lot of people were um, so suspicious that they refused to talk to me, um, uh, uh, you know, at all. Um, but I think there was enough curiosity and um, actually in the methodological appendix of the book, I think I include an excerpt from my own field notes where I'm trudging out of the desert and I look really pathetic. And one of the guys is sort of like looking me up and down and saying, you know, like you can tell he like, is sort of like, okay, you're really weird because you're from Berkeley. Um, and I don't trust you, but the fact that you 
exposed yourself to the elements, went into the desert at the crack of dawn, and you're clearly really super dehydrated and not doing very well. Like there was this sense of like, okay, so she's here and she's actually going to take us seriously. And she's not just going to, you know, write us off as a bunch of, you know, um, fools. Right. Um, so, so that also helped. And I think being a woman also really helped. I think there was a sense of like, you're a little girl. And so you can't really be dangerous to our project. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to a question from Fantasia Painter. She says, first, I want to say thank you so much for this talk. I'm curious about how the state appears as the arbiter of belonging and how class mobility factors into that project. These folks, Gail and Rick, are literally at the line. And as you mentioned with Gail, that's where they want to be. How does the undermining the state manifest as interrupting, stopping, changing, or enabling the movement of brown bodies? So I think that's in a way kind of the inverse of what you were talking about in response to Martine's question, but what, like, if they're focused on the state, like, what, how does it get zoomed in on, uh, on these, on these immigrants? Like, why does that become the locus? Um, <clears throat> well, I think, I think, uh, I think part of it has to do with, um, this sort of like the prominence of border patrol in the uh, and the border specifically in the debate about immigration right um you know we don't talk necessarily about the role of employers we don't necessarily talk about the role of um other actors certainly there is more conversation about lo local law enforcement but the border has become um and you know there's many reasons for that but the border has become sort of the what we think of, and when I say we, I'm talking about like the public thinks of when they think about the immigration problem, right? So, um, so that's part of why the activists are, um, you know, uh, you know, being are attracted to to this border, right? If you're going to deal with the immigration problem, you have to go to the border, kind of thing. Um, even though. Ironically, um, the things that they're doing at the border isn't necessarily going to bring about this big, impactful change, right? So it really is um, an engagement in the symbolic politics. Now, having said that, however, being in the desert and interacting with Border Patrol feels very different, feels very um, like a lot is at stake, right? Um, because um, you know, uh, trying to shield, right, migrants from border patrol gaze, um, and then, or, you know, trying to make sure that border patrol agents know that there's this migrant path that, that, that they haven't seen, that feels very immediately impactful, right? Like, literally, you're interacting with the state, right? And you're not just, like, local state, but, like, federal state agents, right? And, um, you know, you are instrumental, right, uh, in um, this sort of gatekeeping process, right, whether you're going to facilitate this migrant's ability to um, make it to their destination in the US or ensure that they get detained and deported. So it feels like, you know, it's this really um, immediate um, material effect on people's lives, right? Um, and even though that, you know, on a sort of grand scale, it's not that impactful. Um, I don't know if I quite answered this question, but I hope I answered some bit of it. I'm not sure. Maybe we'll get a follow up. Um, if not, um, Christine Trost, who's the executive director of the Institute for um, Governmental Studies has a question. I asked her to join us on camera. I thought other people were going to be on camera, so I'm a little <laughs> But hi, uh, Professor Elsiaglu. Um, thank you for this incredible talk. Absolutely amazing. So exciting to see your work come to fruition in this way. I have a question about um, 
the per, the um, pro-immigrant activists that you yeah. uh, observed and, and spent time with. And I'm wondering, you you set up a contrast between the humanitarians versus the soldiers. Yeah. And I'm wondering where people of faith fit into your yeah. analysis and whether or not you ran into activists who who may have at least said they're not motivated by their privilege or a feeling of conflict between being a progressive yeah. and, and being privileged, but that actually what they think they're doing is an act of faith, that what they think is not about uh, an act of privilege or class or trying to rectify that, but it's about being called to do something um, because of their faith, because welcoming the stranger is, is a fundamental yeah. uh, commandment in essence. And so I wonder, did it, did you just not run into these people of faith people, or did you see them, but you thought that eh, it's not really faith that's motivating them, it's really class that's motivating them, or is it possible that both things were motivating them? And I can take my question off the air. <laughs> <laughs> Christine, it's so good to see you, and um, thank you so much. Uh, um, for everything you've done for me uh, to get to this point. Um, Christine was a really important mentor. Um, and uh, I, I would say an, uh, um, a sort of almost a member on my dissertation committee, I would say. Um, so uh, I think that's a really excellent, important question. I actually do address it in the book, um, even though I'm not really talking about it here as much. Um, yes, uh, a lot of faith-based um, mobilization, uh, faith-based people uh, on the left. Um, so, uh, you know, my findings definitely um, reinforce uh, previous literature about how much um, the immigrant rights movement actually has benefited from, um, from faith organizations and people who are motivated by faith. Um, so that's absolutely there. Now, when I talk to people, they didn't say, hey, you know, I feel really conflicted <laughs> between my sort of progressive ideas and my class background, right? That's kind of my analytic imposition on the, on the very sort of complex, messy details of their lives. So when I sort of looked at it as a pattern, like that's the pattern I saw. When people talked about their lives, they definitely use the language of faith a lot. A lot of my respondents did on the left, not so much on the right, which was also an interesting finding, I think. Um, so people would say, um, you know, I had a lot of respondents who were pastors um, or who had, um, you know, uh, uh, spent a lot of time being, um, you know, just deeply involved in the, in their in their churches and 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 so forth, um, and um, and definitely that welcoming the stranger is a key part of that narrative. I think one thing that they would say that maybe speaks more directly, you know, that that shows how the faith discourse kind of aligns with the 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 identity that I'm I'm. Um, uh, that I'm seeing is this idea that, um, uh, that let's see if I can get this right, um, that, you know, Jesus was also a refugee um, and, or that, that there are all these stories of, um, you know, uh, of people who we admire, right, biblical um, figures who we admire who are refugees and migrants. Um, so sort of working on behalf of migrants is a way to sort of practice our faith, right? Um, but a lot of that has to do with coming from that, that sense of if I don't engage with migrants, right, then I'm not practicing my faith, right? So, but that that's a class thing, right? So, I am in a position in, in a, um, I don't know how to explain it, but like I am, sur I am living such a class life or a middle-class life that, um, that I don't feel like I'm practicing my faith. Uh, and so I have to go to the border where I'm interacting with, um, with migrants who are these sort of Jesus-like figures um, 
and uh, the why they are Jesus like is because they're from a different class than I am. And I feel like, you know, there's this sort of a uh, feeling of moral obligation um, that very much is premised on that class difference and the sense of, I need to do something because I'm so privileged in this way and these people are not. So I, I'm sorry, I didn't articulate that as well as I could have, but um, definitely faith is quite important and it's being used or I'm, I saw that faith as being um, it's still in line with that uh, identity that uh, of being progressive or privileged. Thank you. Um, Can I ask her a follow-up question? I, you know, it has to do with Christine, and it has to do with her uh, analytic uh, framework. And that is, you know, you're talking about the issue of class privilege. Um, I'd like to hear you say a little bit more. What what st strikes me. When you're when your comments are the fact that the middle class seems to be above the law or it doesn't seem like the law somehow that they can actually get away with being illegal. Actually, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, that you have a border. It's illegal to cross it. Um, you know, they're not just helping people and then turning them over to the border patrol. That is, they're not just giving them water and food. So they don't starve to death or anything, but you know they they don't turn them over to the border patrol. So I'm wondering uh, the fact that they're enabling actually an illegal act. I guess I'd say to you, this is interesting to me. Is is it class based that you would say that they feel in some kind of way that m many lower class people would not feel because the law comes down very heavily on them? That these middle class people think like yes, it's against the law, but Somehow they won't treat, they'll treat me better and I will be able to get along away with it more. Uh, yes, Martina, I think um, there's definitely a class dimension uh, uh, to um, that emboldens, emboldens them to do what they're doing. Um, but I also think uh, their whiteness, right, is really, really key because when you're in the desert, right, I'm a middle class person and I was in the desert um, and the American citizenship part too, right? Um, you know, when I was in the desert with the humanitarians, I was always really uncomfortable during the encounters with Border Patrol in a way that um, the other humanitarians were not. So I think definitely the middle class aspect is important because, you know, you can question the agent in a way that maybe, um, you know, that you can sort of harness all your cultural capital and um, the way you look and, um, you know, uh, the fact that you know the, I don't know, the, the particulars of of the law, et cetera, to kind of get out of those encounters without getting in trouble. Um, so I definitely think that class is important, but I think whiteness is also quite key um, to being able to mobilize in this particular way. Um, and it's that that I think really pulls these people, right? Because they feel like this is, you know, this is a kind of activism that not everyone can do, right? Um, you know, so, you know, I'm going to do it. Um, so I think definitely there's both class and race involved. The other thing I will say is that um, even though uh, there's been some people who sort of made the argument that, that, I mean, this is like a contentious area, right? Like, by putting out water in the desert, are you in fact um, enabling, right? Um, are you enabling an illegal act? Um, but actually the humanitarians have hired a bunch of lawyers and, um, and they've been really careful about figuring out what they can and cannot do because they know that they can um, get sued and they could get arrested and they could, you know, all of these things. And so, you know, they have very specific protocols about like, for instance, you can, you know, give food and water and general orienting advice. So you might say, this is North, 
this is south, you know, um, et cetera, but you can't give them a map, right? Um, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know how things have changed in the last couple of years in terms of like actual like uh, specific protocols in the desert. Um, but when I was doing field work, they were very careful about just like making sure. I mean, when you're actually in the moment, whether a volunteer actually follows those protocols is a separate question. And some volunteers uh, who are maybe more anarchist in their in their worldview might not follow it as closely as someone else who, um, you know, uh, was maybe more uh, oriented towards like following the law. Um, we have a question from Jacqueline Adams, who's also an ethnographer, and she says, "Thank you for your talk. I'd like to ask how concretely." you analyzed the three sets of data together, the interviews, the field notes, and media and text to come up with your findings. Thank you, Jacqueline. That's the million dollar question, right? <laughs> what are we doing behind the scenes? Um, I think um, what I concretely did, um, and I should have, I wish I had my files, like they're on the bookshelf, I can't, get to them right now but I literally printed out all my interviews I printed out I'm, I'm a very sort of paper oriented person um I printed out all of the interviews I printed out all of my field notes I mean we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of um stuff and I would literally just go through by hand coding I tried some of the qualitative analysis software I, it's just not my thing um I like to do things by hand um and it was you know you literally have to reread your notes over and over again writing tons of memos right um sort of trying to ask asking yourself questions like what do these interviews have in common? Or, um, you know, what is one thing that everyone seems to be really concerned about? Or, um, you know, what is motivating these people? I mean, when I went into the field, I had very straightforward questions that I was that I was wondering about, which is like, why are people doing this? You know, I didn't have a puzzle. I didn't have any of those things. I just went in wondering, why are people doing this? Because to me, and maybe this is my, me as a sociologist or me as a very cynical person, I am always amazed at collective action. I'm always amazed at groups mobilizing, like getting their act together and actually doing something together, right? Like I find that really amazing um, and, and startling. And so, um, and not only that, but they're doing this in like really difficult circumstances. Not only is it a very contentious sort of political, um, you know, environment, but, you know, uh, going into the desert is not an easy ordeal. I mean, it really, um, you know, it, it's a, it's, it's a really difficult thing to do. So, you know, the question, and, you know, I just, I kept wondering, why are you doing this, you know, and, um, you know, you're not getting paid to do it. Um, in a lot of cases, on the left, um, there were a lot of young people who were sort of saying, oh my God, I'm getting so much pressure from my parents and my family to stop doing this and like, go live a real life and get an education and whatever. So I really went into it just asking that question. And then, you know, um, taking all that data. And then, you know, the other thing is that it's kind of an iterative process is sometimes you go into the field, you collect all this data and you realize afterwards that that data is not as useful as you hoped it would be. Um, so that's why the revisit is usually very important. Or in my case, I also kept in touch with a lot of people and would just ask a lot of follow-up questions. Um, and writing a lot of memos, talking to a lot of um, colleagues, right? All of those kinds of things. Um, we have a question that kind of ties into what you were just talking about, about the collective action. Um, Andy Chang, one of your former uh, peers um, says, thank you for your very timely and important talk. Could you talk a bit more about how the identity formation of whiteness as reflected in your respondents' life stories informs and is informed by the politics of race and gender in the broader 
conservative slash liberal movements in the US. Um, that's an interesting question. I haven't really thought about it um, in that way. Um, I mean, I think one way to answer this is by saying that, you know, the US is a highly racially segregated place, right? And so I think that um, whether you mobilize on the left or the right, um, and especially with my respondents, they were in very racially homogenous places, um, or uh, when they mobilize, you know, they're interacting with a lot of people that look like them, that identify like them. Um, and I think that, at least for the conservative movements, they're also generally uh, quite racially homogenous and, um, you know, even, um, you know, people live in, in racially homogenous neighborhoods. So then, you know, if they get involved in a local organization or local movement, that tends to attract, unless you're living in a very um, diverse, big city, um, but even then, right? So I think it does, um, the sort of centrality of whiteness in this case reflects the fact that, you know, there is this highly racialized, racially segregated society that people are, you know, that people are sort of reacting to, right? And all of these identities um, have to, are, are sort of a function of that racial segregation. So that's kind of how I would, I would say, um, I would sort of respond to that point. I, ha I have a related question about the broader social movements um, that, you know, on the right and the left and how they sort of, these particular groups sort of map onto that or don't. Um, it seems like on the right, small government is, you know, a rallying cry and an ideology, even yeah. though that's not always put into practice, as we know. Um, so it's interesting that the yeah. that the soldiers want to strengthen the state yeah. because that seems like to go against the ideology yeah. of small government. Yes, um, this has come up with a lot of people uh, when I talked to them in the past about this and it, it was surprising to me too. Um, I think part of that has to do with the fact that when Republicans um, advocate for small government, they're thinking about the left hand of the state. So they're thinking about welfare programs, they're thinking about schools, they're thinking about hospitals, they're thinking about, you know, all these different public services. They're not thinking about law enforcement, they're not thinking about the military. Um, they're not thinking about the coercive aspects of the state, right? Whereas in, in my field work, the part of the state that people were fixated on was the coercive part, right? So literally what is Border Patrol doing and why aren't they doing, you know, for the, for the right, it was sort of why aren't they doing all these other things that they should be doing? Why aren't they, um, you know, why... Um, you know, why are they so feeble? Um, and then on the left, it was sort of like, oh my gosh, Border Patrol is like, um, or immigration control has literally colonized every sector of society. Um, and, uh, you know, Border Patrol is highly militarized. And, um, you know, so, so the part of the state that, um, that is sort of occupying people's imaginations um, is different, right? Then, so it's less about the welfare aspect and more about the course of aspect. And I think in some ways that is sort of reflective of um, the main politics or the main sort of big political struggles that we're facing today in the US, right? Um, the big things that people are talking about is the role of police. Should we defund them, right? Or um, is, is it, is it okay to have police, you know, or, um, you know, so, so these conversations really are about, um, in some ways, less about sort of uh, public provision, right, sort of in the kind of um, FDR sense, and more about sort of, um, you know, do we want to um, you know, have this, uh, you know, do we want police, right? Um, so I think, you know, this is, 
this is where the conversation is moving towards, or this is where the political con contention is moving towards, right? Not just around immigration, but in general, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have a totally unrelated question, which is one of the ways your work has evolved since your student days is these beautiful images that you showed in your talk. <laughs> and I'm just curious where they came from and how did you decide to you know, use drawings? Yeah. Just kind of your choice um, of representation of yeah so i um actually another someone else asked me why i didn't include these images in the book it's literally because i drew them all myself wow. a couple of weekends ago um, <laughs> so um so i had these i have a lot of photographs um but i was worried about people being um recognized and then trying to distort the images it just didn't really um work out you know the distortion effect that you can do on powerpoint um so i decided that i would just draw them by hand um changing some of the things so that they weren't recognizable so yeah and it was very therapeutic you know it was just something different and and I also realized um, it's actually it's kind of like going through your field notes, right? Um, reading it like a second or third time in detail, you start you see things that you hadn't seen before. So drawing these um, images kind of, I don't know, helped me see things that I, I was like, oh, uh, you know, I, I mean, it was just like little things like uh, noticing that people had certain um, like the paraphernalia on the soldiers, all the, the gear that they had, I realized, wow, that's like really heavy, you know, like all this stuff that they're carrying around. Um, but they're doing this because they really want to do it. And, you know, but they're really suffering, you know, as they're doing this. Um, so, yeah, so I made the images myself and I wish I had thought to do it, uh, you know, earlier, I would have definitely included them in the book. Well, you can do a graphic novel version. <laughs> I, can read the uh, I have another question. I actually have two more questions, actually, Fidan, and uh, they're not actually related. Okay. Uh, so I, I might have to take a note on them. Um, okay. So the first is, uh, you don't know this, but I am from the Sonata Desert on the other side, and so I do know about the Sonata yeah. Desert. Yeah. Um, um, and I and I looked at your map, one of your drawings, and I noticed that uh, a good portion of it is in the Dona Odom uh, section, yeah. which uh, is open uh, and much more open, and much more of the action for the militias, etc., are not in that area, but are in you know are in the state side. And I'm wondering whether uh, whether there's any evidence not necessarily one that you've done, but any evidence that says, uh, that gives us some glimpse about how the Tono Odom are responding uh, to actually people coming over the border uh, because they would not see this as, uh, as being, you know, a positive. Um, the second question is independent. Uh, and it goes back to the things that were raised about the view of of the border patrol um and that is um uh, you used and i you know is that they are a coercive element uh, quote unquote or the coercive element but they don't need to be uh seen as that i mean you could imagine both sides taking a different other one could say they're the they're the protective element of the society rather than the coercive element of the society it's already seems to me to be loaded on uh, social movement sorts of areas, whether you're to the left or to the right, because one could imagine the Border Patrol, as in the DEA, stopping drugs from coming over the border that many people uh, on left and right would think is a positive thing, uh, as opposed to this issue of humans coming over the border. So I guess I think I'd ask, whether this idea about the right wing and Rick is where Rick just thinks that they're doing a good thing. There's just not enough of them. Um, and uh, the other side may not even have a view on, you haven't even said what the view of 
the left was about the border patrol. I mean, it's, you know, so I'd be interested in that. So those are the two questions. Um, thank you. Um, so I think this question about how the Tohono O'odham Nation fits into this politics is an absolutely important one. I don't talk about it in the book um, because it deserves multiple books um, this topic. It's um, and in fact, when I started doing research, I was thinking about doing research on the Tohono O'odham Nation and and really sort of how. Um, uh, people in the nation who, who live there, um, you know, made sense of not only the migrants, but also Border Patrol, how they made sense of, um, you know, civilian organizations, um, you know, whether they're putting out water or whether they're um, conducting armed patrols, um, sort of how they made sense of it. Because, um, you know, this is a really interesting sort of intersection of the politics of indigenous sovereignty with right. the politics of, um, right. you know, U.S. immigration, right? And the, uh, so for those of you in the audience who might not know this, but Tohono O'odham Nation is one of those indigenous nations that's actually bisected by the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, so they have um, members, Tohono O'odham members who live in Mexico, but who are part of this nation and who technically should be, technically are American citizens and should have access to American resources. But it is uh, very difficult increasingly with the militarization of the border um, and the buildup of the border fence um, for people to just go back and forth and see family, access resources, et cetera. So this has been, and not only that, but Border Patrol, um, because it's considered federal land, um, uh, Border Patrol has a very heavy presence on the nation. And um, a lot of people think about this as an occupation. So they might, they say, you know, Border Patrol, um, you know, has, have these big sort of, um, uh, vans and uh, they, you know, drive over, um, uh, you know, uh, these uh, sacred lands, sacred sites. Um, uh, there's a lot of incidents of people getting run over by Border Patrol. Um, and um, so, you know, there is a lot of anger towards Border Patrol. Um, at the same time, however, um, the the tribal government of the Tohono O'odham Nation has received a lot of grants from the Department of Homeland Security. And so they are, um, you know, they're a little bit more on the fence about, um, you know, they, they don't want to necessarily take an anti-border patrol or stance or say the border patrol is an occupying force because, um, you know, these grants are really important for the, you know, for various projects that they have on the nation. So um, this community is really um, kind of, you know, is uh, bombarded by mul uh, from multiple sides. And I should say that the nation, just like any community, right, is very stratified. It's very, um, you know, the tribal government has might have different interests than people who are not in the tribal government. And then even within the tribal government, there's a lot of variation in people's political viewpoints, right? Um, so that's important. And I think there's also a lot of generational divides. I mean, this is just anecdotal evidence, but I think um, some of the younger folks tend to be, um, might be a little bit more radical in, or I shouldn't say radical, but they, they might be more sympathetic towards migrants than say some of the older, older folks. The other piece of this, unfortunately, is that because there is so much unemployment and um, there's not a lot of resources, that area, you know, um, underinvested, underdeveloped, um, a lot of people uh, have, um, you know, work in the trade, right, of of smuggling people or of, of contraband. Um, so this also is, you know, and it could be something really simple, like they have a shed, right? And then someone approaches them and says, can we rent your shed? And you say, yes. Um, so that now you're involved, even though you do nothing besides, let, you know, rent your shed to this person, right? But in this way, you become part of this organization and your livelihood might depend on it. 
right? And so then that's another sort of factor that might um, position you on this politics in one way or another. Um, so it's very complicated and I would encourage whoever is in the audience who is looking for topics um, uh, to you know, consider it. And I think another thing that this speaks to is that as migration scholars, we need to take um, you know, uh, indigenous groups very seriously. It's very important, you know, like I, there's much more intersection between migration studies and indigenous studies than we are admitting to. And this is like a very empirical case of that. Um, and then uh, in terms of your second question, Martine, um, I, so, um, so you were asking about my usage of the word coercive. I meant it more in an analytic sense rather than a sort of social justice kind of sense. I meant it more as um, the part of the state that you know uses force, physical force, or the threat of physical force, um, versus the more sort of provision. You know, it, the more sort of um, you know. Uh, trying to help you find a job or, you know, giving you various social services, that kind of thing. Although, you know, separating them out in the stark way is, is also problematic. Obviously they're very interrelated. Um, so that's all I meant by when I said that. Um, yes, one could make the argument that, you know, Border Patrol is providing this kind of protection, um, which, um, you know, which is certainly an argument that the um, that Rick and his comrades are making. I think in some ways what's interesting is that, um, and, and this is not true for all the groups. Well, okay. One thing that um, Rick and his comrades say is, you know, they feel really sorry for the the ordinary Border Patrol field agent, right? The the guy at the bottom of the totem pole who has to go out into the desert on his own in his vehicle for hours and hours on end, you know, trying to find migrant paths. Um, but they have less sympathy or less um, less feeling of gratitude or, yeah, sympathy towards uh, people at the top, right? So the, the, the commissioner or the whomever um, is at the top of the border patrol. So they feel much more kinship with the people on the ground, the state agents on the ground than they do with, um, because they associate that with sort of the federal level with the government, with DC politics, that kind of thing um, versus, you know, the agents on the ground. Um, yes. I'll just leave it at that. I know it's a, it's a, what you're asking is a very complicated question, actually. <laughs> We're just about out of time, but I don't know if you can answer in, you know, 30 seconds. Jacqueline would also like to know what media and texts did you analyze and where did you look for them? Um, uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Again, a great um, question about methodology. Um, so I analyzed a lot, anything that, so I literally had a Google alert for the organizations that I studied. So anytime they were mentioned in the news, I would get an alert about it. So th that was part of my sort of um, uh, content analysis. Um, and uh, I also kept track of all, so these, <laughs> these organizations produce a lot of media, right? Um, both on the left and the right. So on the left, it's a lot of press releases, a lot of like emails and um, Facebook posts and things like that. So I kept, kept track of that. Um, I was also very involved in actually writing a lot of these press releases because you know, that's what I've been trained in doing is writing. Um, so a lot of these organizations basically said, hey, if you're going to study us, then you got to, you got to, you know, <laughs> do something, right? Um, so I was, you know, I would help with a lot of the, the sort of public facing stuff. Um, um, and then, you know, and also use that. Um, and then for on the right, a lot, a lot of the, the stuff that they produced actually um, uh, 
were on videos. Um, so there was a, like, for example, the soldiers would constantly publish videos of um, uh, that, uh, that they had um, captured using their little hidden cameras in the desert of people who were crossing, um, presumably without documents. And, um, you know, they would publish that on Facebook, or they would publish that on various um, media, they would share it with, um, with news outlets and things like that. So that was also a key part of the stuff that I um, that I analyzed. And I just want to add one final thought is, I think, and this is not something that we've talked about, but I hope that the Center for Ethnographic Research considers this as a future topic, is sort of how do we do ethnography in this moment of pandemic, right? Because I know a lot of students are, were planning, um, or a lot of researchers were planning to do ethnographic research, and now they kind of have to change all those plans. Um, and I think, you know, um, uh, I think we need to also think about the enterprise of ethnography and whether, you know, we have to do it in this really immersive kind of way um, or whether there is a way to do ethnography that is not only more conducive to pandemic situations like the current one, but that's just a little bit more conducive to work family balance. Um, so, I mean, I was just before we started I was just telling Martin that, you know, I could never do the field work that I did in Arizona. I could never replicate that again um, because now I have a kid and I have a family and I have all these other sort of commitments and responsibilities. Um, and that feels like a loss. It feels like somehow, does that mean that I'm not really an ethnographer anymore? But I, I want to not think of it that way. I think that, you know, if we want to make ethnography an inclusive, um, you know, something that's inclusive of different kinds of lives, lifestyles, including the lives of mothers, um, including the lives of women, including the lives of people of color, um, you know, uh, people who don't necessarily have a lot of resources, financial capital, et cetera. Um, you know, we need to sort of rethink what ethnography, what kinds of ethnographies are acceptable. Um, and that, you know, maybe, uh, maybe the pandemic offers an, us an opportunity to think about it. Um, thank you very much for that. And also just a quick plug, we actually have an upcoming event on December 4th that's going to look at um, comparative ethnography and part of it will also talk about um, during, during COVID. So um, check our website for, for more details on that. Um, we're just a little bit over time, so I think we'll have to end there, but um, thank you all very much for joining us, and thank you to Professor Elchiola for her wonderful talk and work. So Thank you so much. I really, I really enjoyed this. Thank you, Fidel. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.